Leave Your Name at the Border by Manuel Munoz. Welcome everyone. Hello. So today's presentation, I'm going to address Manuel Munoz's essay, Leave Your Name at the Border. It's an interesting title, very uh, implicitly political, uh, in which he addresses how uh, the process of assimilation in the U.S., um, doesn't have quite a doesn't quite have a welcoming feel, right? Um, by by welcoming, I, I mean there's a bit of friction as one attempts to assimilate with regards to the language. How so? Well, let's begin right off the bat. This following essay, I'm providing a, an exemplification genre overview in which uh, the author makes an argument and then further supports it with examples throughout. Okay, so his argument, and I, I find this to be his primary argument in the, in the essay. He says, the corrosive effect of assimilation is the displacement of one culture over another, the inability to sustain more than one way of being. So let's break down the thesis a little bit. His subject, the corrosive effect of assimilation, um, the point he's addressing about this assimilation process, you see, even, even the subject in and of itself already has that tarnishing attribute to it, that, that assimilation is not quite a good thing here. Why not? Well, it displaces one culture over another. And the reason for that is that in this country, there's an inability to sustain more than one way of being. Right? Uh, maybe we can ask, is, would this be the case if, if we speak English and we went to another country, would this also be applicable? Would this be the same argument we would make? And, and, and I think he has a good point because you, you see how you, we might, we may certainly have people who would be critical. You know, if you're from America and you're in the Middle East, historical regions might, might not um, quite color us in a good way. But, you know, a lot of Middle Easterners also speak English, so uh, it, it wouldn't be the language. Uh, at least I'm going to argue that it may not necessarily be the language. It would be the mere fact that one is American, right? The, the labeling where Westerners were already in contrast to, uh, you know, their East, the, the Eastern perspective. But then again, if you, see, I'm stereotyping. I'm stereotyping, maybe wrongly assuming, so it may not be the case, right? Well... What are his examples? He begins with an interesting example of a gate agent who pronounces this name, and I'll say the name in which he, she didn't pronounce it. The name is Eugenio Reyes. Uh, very ethnic, very cultural. But he, he says she pronounces it in an anglicized manner that interestingly, at least in this region, he's referring to the, the central California region of Fresno, it would not be uncommon it's interesting, isn't it? Because if you go to L.A., you know, um, it's not uncommon to see a lot of, di uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mexican-American diversity there. And even in Northern California, even uh, although Northern California is, you know, has more, uh, there's areas like Chinatown, you know, more of an Asian culture. But you're still going to have Mexican-Americans up in that region. Well, um He's gonna he's gonna he's gonna finish this example of the Eugenio Reyes uh, pronunciation Eugenio Reyes probably uh, at the end of the essay and we'll look at that and we'll talk about it further. But his second example is is a personal one in which he starts addressing how American names begin to dominate uh, within his family nephews nieces cousins uh, and he says. This process of assimilation in which the names are very Americanized uh, promotes a kind of English-only way of life, which partly explains the quiet erasure of cultural difference that assimilation has attempted to accomplish. And the, one of the examples there is the name Caitlin Cepeda. So, you know, if you're going to be public, he addresses it further on in the essay, you gotta make sure you speak English. So we're gonna we're gonna give you an English name, American name, right? It sounds very the the the, the English flows phonetically flows nicely through it. Caitlin, 
right? Uh, which is different if, if her name maybe was, um, uh, uh, let's say, um, Francisca, or maybe Antonia, you know, and here, here, even Antonia, she already has kind of an exotic ring to it, right? And, and um, not necessarily in a good way. It sounds, it sounds questionable. Well, um, um, the interesting thing about language is in America, there's the assumption that it's an English-only way of life, English-only type of perspective. Here, metaphorically, is the Tower of Babel, which in the, in the biblical scriptures, uh, the people try to build this tower all the way to the heavens. And they built it so up in, towards the heavens so that, uh, 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 well, so that they could reach heaven. <laughs> but uh, God, as he's looking down on these, you know, silly silly uh, builders, or, you know, architects, engineers, what have you. Um, he, he changes their language so that they don't understand one another. And thus the mythical explanation of why we have differing languages. In a way, you could argue it's kind of celebratory of multiculturalism and, and the diversity of language in the U.S. But according to Munoz, in, his, in this essay at least, Spanish was and still is viewed with suspicion, right? If you have an accent or if you speak in a certain language, you're, you're not fully American, are you? So how do we make you fully American? Well, assu assumingly, one of the ways is uh, the mutability of the English language onto, uh, onto a name. So like nephews, nieces, cousins named Daniel, Olivia, Marco. <laughs> so and, and I would argue that you know if we say each of those names we we could also pronounce them maybe in in a very ethnic manner Marco Olivia right Daniel um but no we're not going to do that if you want to assimilate okay uh the next example he provides is the example of a math teacher and the the interesting thing about this example is that the math teacher rather than not pronounce these names correctly actually pronounces these names with with perfection and 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 the way he relates it is look this math teacher was pronouncing our names so perfect it was embarrassing so i'm not sure if these these certainly probably not the names so i'm going to exaggerate the matter a little bit but he was probably saying domitilia right horacio uh, um, maybe i even mispronounced them <laughs> but this math teacher didn't and he was caucasian blue-eyed blonde-haired yet the family felt embarrassed the family didn't quite feel honor because culturally they're not the name the, those correct pronunciations of the names <clears throat> excuse me those correct pronunciations of the names are not um, um they don't they don't allow a proper assimilation process. Okay. Um, so he further says, names that stood as barriers to a complete embrace of an American identity simply because their pronunciations required a slip into Spanish, the otherness that assimilation was supposed to erase. So here's a couple of those ethnic names. Amado, Lucio, Elida, and you see the, the the different the difference in the names, right? Uh, how would I say Amado in English? Amado, right? How would I say Elida in English? Elida, Elida. Right? There's a, there's a bit bit of incongruous incongruency there, right? So that's an interesting example regarding the names. The next example is uh, with regards to his uh, stepfather. Stepfather's name is Antonio. Uh, and he gives this uh, he gives this example of how uh, you know he's a farmer he get, he's got to get out there so if he's if he if the if the farm owner he's looking for these farmers and these workers and he's trying to get their name right if he said my name is Antonio and the farm worker is attempting to say Antonio then it might affect him with regards to a job 
I mean, this is a tough one, right? Because how do you maintain your culture if your culture is keeping you from surviving? That's a very interesting example by, by uh, Manuel. So, it's okay if you call me Antonio at home, but out there in public, make sure it's Tony. And, and you see us, you know, you, if you're of Mexican-American descent and you talk to people who are, um, <clears throat> who are, uh, you know, whose names are maybe Antonio or, or Francisco or Rogelio, you're going to hear instead Roger, Frank, Tony, right? Um, so then there's, there's that example, right? His next example, he says he goes to, he goes to the East Coast and he notices things are different. He notices that, you know, as he get as he goes away from Dinuva, uh, people of, that are of minority descent, they're proud of their names. And they, and they, they almost say it as, you know, recognize my identity. Recognize my identity because uh, if you criticize me, I'm going to let you know about it. And, and he tells that example, right? And, and he shows how the non-assimilation process is almost empowering. And, and that brings in another example, the, the, the example of code switching, of using English and, English and Spanish interchangeably. And how, and how in this code switching process, for example, as I'm talking here, tú sabes hablando así diferente, speaking something like intermixing Spanish con el español, right? I'm doing a terrible job of code switching. But anyways, this code switching aspect is allowing a manipulation of the English language, of, of breaking those so-called English-only rules. So he goes to the East Coast as he's getting an education, and he returns to Dinuba. He's he's going to end the example here. He's going to he's going to end a series of examples here when he goes back to to his uh, hometown, and now when they don't pronounce his name Manuel correctly, and are instead instead maybe saying Manuel, right? He says, you know, I, it it doesn't quite ring well with me anymore. I I've been enlightened. I've left. I've left the, I left the you know my hometown where I thought English only was the right way to account for things, <clears throat> but elsewhere, outside in this region in this space, I'm realizing that you know it, there's just something off here. My culture, <clears throat> my culture seems to be lost. Um, and he says, unfortunately, my stepfather and you can't blame Tony for being Tony, right? He's got to work. Uh, my stepfather still answers to Tony. Their anglicized names begin to signify who does and who does not belong, who was born here and who is the Aya. So now in this region of Dinuba, if somebody comes in and they ask, what's your name? Rogelio, ah, you're from the Aya. You're from over there. Right? And so this realization shows, um, uh, sh demonstrated to Manuel Muñoz, how, um, you know, a consideration, how if, he, had he not left, then he may have never been enlightened. And so now he's, we return to the gate agent, you know, it's kind of like a full circle with uh, Eugenio Reyes. <clears throat> and he says, I don't know if he was coming, Eugenio Reyes, right? Or going, Eugenio Reyes. I, or maybe I have it backwards. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so um, this is his essay. And so how does how does he close? Right. He he closes in this manner, in this kind of almost postmodern manner, uh, in which we're trying to further understand, you know, the 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 the, the connection between identity and the language. Okay. I hope this helps you. Uh, Leave Your Name at the Border by Manuel Muñoz. Thank you.